so I'm David Slater. I am the Director of Trade and Investment at an organisation called London and Partners that I'll tell you about in a minute. We are the Mayor's promotional organisation. And when I say that, I'm not promoting just the Mayor of London because, as you all know, that's one thing that he doesn't need my help with. <laughs> Although he and I share two things, uh, a tailor and a hairdresser. <laughs> so here we go. So similar to what you've just heard about the organisations in Vancouver, London and Partners is a non-for-profit, public-private partnership and the promotional and economic development company for London. And the reason we're a company is because it doesn't half help you when you're talking to business to say that you've got private sector support. If you say you're a government entity, and I was a diplomat for 25 years, so I'm going to be very non-diplomatic here, people kind of say, well, that's good, but what do you know about doing business? If you can say my team is actually made up of business people and I'm just the front man, or as BBC called me, the mayor's overseas salesman, then it gives that little bit more credibility. Actually, they called me a used car salesman, but that's the media for you. Anyway, so we've got five areas of operation. What we're trying to do is to influence people who are making a decision between cities or countries, but as Colin said, cities. So it could be a tourist. You've heard about the... Uh, empty nesters in North America. We want them to come to London. We want London to be top of their list when they're thinking about making a holiday. So we run visitlondon.com. We also are the uh, convention bureau. Conventions are big business in London. Big business. We've got the European Society of Cardiologists coming. 30,000 delegates. The economic benefit from that is huge. I'll give you a heart attack. The, the major events bureau, so what, what we're doing there, why did we win the Olympics? It wasn't by accident. We won the Olympics because we actually went after it. We needed help from the government because they underwrote it, but we went after it as a pitch. So we're trying to influence people to bring major events to London. Champions League football, Olympics, you know, world athletics, swimming, whatever it is. We're also trying to influence students. Students are really important to us, international students particularly. And as Colm said, if it's about innovation and ideas, you want the world's best brains to come and study in your colleges. Some of them will leave, but they'll go with an affinity for London. Some of them will stay, and we want them to stay. And we'll come back to the immigration debate in a moment. And then international trade and investment, which is me. So we're trying to persuade businesses when they're thinking about with whom or where to invest or who to trade with to think about London. And the reason we mashed all these different uh, competences together is that decisions are made by people. So it may be the CFO that makes the decision for a company, but he's, he or she's still a person, right? And there's an emotional piece in the decision making. So I've seen lots and lots of inward investment decisions over the years that have fallen on whether or not the executive making the decision knows where his or her spouse is going to shop, where the kids are going to go to school, what it's like to live in London, you know, what do I do at the weekends, all this sort of thing. And because we're the Tourism Bureau, hopefully I can explain to them what London's got to offer. I can explain to them where the kids can go to school. I can explain to them where we are as a global city. So that's why the mayor, when he was elected, mashed all these separate entities together to make London and partners. And the and partners bit is the private sector piece because I can talk to business about why London for them, but I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an accountant, I'm not an HR specialist. Companies need professional support in order to make sure they make the best informed decision based around what they want to do, not what I want them to do, but what they want to do. Because if you think you're going to tell them what to do, you're in the wrong game. Persuade them based on what they want to do and the drivers in their business plan and tailor the information to it. And hopefully, you then get the decision that you want. A little bit about London. London's very, very different to any large city in Europe. We're the only city that is growing our population. Large cities tend to be shrinking in Europe. We're growing. We're 8.5 million people now. 9 million by 2020. 10 million by 2030. So 100,000 people a year in London and it's birth rate mainly, a little bit of immigration, but mainly birth rate that's doing that. Now, the mayor doesn't take complete responsibility for the birth rate of London, but 
there was a, a, a bubble, shall we say, uh, around the Olympics and post-Olympics. But the immigration debate, we've just had an election, as you know, can really polarise what it is a city says about itself. And UKIP, which is now our independence party, which, which ran on a reform immigration, get out of Europe type agenda, no support for them in London. And that tells you something about how Londoners feel about where their city is in the world. And 40% of our population weren't born, but were born abroad, let alone in London. Now, why I've put this up, not is to explain to you in even more depth what London and Partners is, but there's two interesting things here. Unless you know what it is you're trying to measure, you won't know how to go after it. So we're tasked by the mayor to deliver jobs and to deliver economic growth. And we have a, the most convoluted um, economic equation to measure the net additional benefit of every job that we bring to London and how much I influenced it. So you tend to see a lot of economic development organisations say we've done 300 projects this year and we've created 50,000 jobs over X years that they don't tell you. We try and look at the jobs over the first year so that we, we look at the numbers that are actually going to be created and we only claim it if the company tells us that's what's going to happen. So jobs is important, but the value of the jobs, and this is where it gets interesting on headquarters because our Office of National Statistics can tell you the average uh, value of a job in tech, in creative industries, in film, in life sciences, in retail, whatever it is, but headquarters... Is it, is it a financial and professional service? Is it, so I'm suggesting, and that's some of the things we look at in London, that headquarters and jobs that come with headquarter functions need to be treated a little bit differently, and you need to work out what the value of that is. Because if you're making strategic decisions in a company, that's, that's really high-value stuff. But it doesn't necessarily correlate with the sector that the company's in. So you need to think about that and the value. And the other thing is... One of our best case studies is when Aon, the American insurance company, moved from Chicago to London. I'd like to tell you I was responsible for it, but I didn't know until they arrived. But leave that to, to one side. But there's about 60 jobs created through that move. So it's not a, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get my knighthood on the back of that. But think of the reputation value to London. So when we say we're going to tell London's story brilliantly, it's not necessarily the value of, of the jobs that comes with headquarters, because there won't be that many, to be honest. There'll be high value, but there won't be that many. But think of what it says about your city and what it says that a great American institution up from Chicago and came to London because London is the most international trading city in the world. Perfect. I couldn't have written it myself. Although I did. So, headquarters. So, we've been after headquarters for as long as anybody can remember. Um, but the latest campaign... So, I was looking back through, through our, our archives. So, we did a campaign in 2004. We did a campaign in 2009. And then, again, we're about to launch one in 2015. But if you, if you sort of... Google it. You won't find huge advertising and marketing spends around London as a headquarters function. It just doesn't work that way. And I wouldn't advise you to do that because when we do our tourism work and you go to these large trade shows, you find every country and city in the world has been sold a new brand. You know, Creative Serbia or Do It in Dubrovnik or whatever it is. And nobody seems to be asking the so what question because you're not going to make a decision based on that sort of brand. It just doesn't work. So, so large marketing spends don't do it, would be my view, or, or the London view. Now, you could say, well, you would say that, Slater, wouldn't you, because London's got probably the most valuable brand of any city in the world. Yes, I accept that. I'd like to say I contributed to it, but I accept it. But I just think that if you're going to do large TV, you know, full-page spread in Forbes or the Wall Street Journal, I just don't know whether that actually changes anybody's mind. 2004, our economy was in good shape, but we thought that there was a need to sustain what we were doing. So that's why we started to look at headquarters as a particular target. Again, 2009, you've got to be slightly careful about how publicly you say this, so please edit this bit out. Um, but Eurozone's in crisis. Companies are thinking, oh my goodness, we've got to think longer term. London said, well, we're not in crisis. Our economy is in relatively good shape, come to London. So 
it's a cutthroat world out there. It's very, very competitive. You've got to differentiate yourself. This was not prying on or preying on what was happening in the user. I mean, it was a fact. Do we want them to stay in Europe? Do we want them to come to London? Or do we want them to go somewhere else? Let's make sure that we go after them. And now, the McKinsey, uh, there's a McKinsey report about headquarters and the rise of companies in the East, you know, the billion-dollar companies. So we thought, well, hang on, you know, most of our investment actually comes from North America. About 40-odd percent comes from North America. Uh, a lot of our headquarters will be North American companies. Box would be a good example. You know, out of San Francisco, VC funded, doing very well. International headquarters, London. You can't run a global operation out of San Francisco is what they told us. I'm sure there's quite a few people in San Francisco would argue that. But if they wanted to be global, they had to come to the most international trading city in the world, London. So off the back of the McKinsey research and things like fluctuations with the Swiss franc. There's an awful lot of companies, both from North America and elsewhere, that are headquartered in Switzerland. The Swiss franc is moving this way and that way. Nobody seems to know. Why wouldn't I go after those companies? Of course I'm going to go after those companies. Everybody wants certainty. So what are the common themes? This is probably the most, I was going to say insightful, but I think when you see it, you might think, well, that's easy. Every company I've ever spoken to has used this as number one driver for why they're making a decision to think of a foreign city or country. Where's the market? Where's the clients? Where are the customers? So I would say, come to London, access the European Union, 500 million consumers, all with disposable income, biggest free trade area in the world, etc., etc., etc. And we ain't going to leave it. Access to talent, very, very important. Because... Companies know that unless they've got the best talent in the world, then they won't necessarily make the best decisions. We've got four of the world's top six universities in London. There's only Boston, Massachusetts got the other two. They've got MIT and Harvard. We've got UCL, we've got Imperial, and we've got Oxford and Cambridge, our two suburbs. See, I told you that wouldn't get a laugh. <laughs> I was told if I said Surrey is a suburb of Vancouver, that would get a laugh. But talent's important. We've got 45 universities in London, all with different disciplines. Talent, really, really important. I've got a case study in a moment, but Google have just invested a billion dollars in a new facility that's being built now in London, in a part of North London near King's Cross uh, Station. And it's no accident that Central St. Martins, which is our school for the creative arts, is right next door. So they're not necessarily going for the techies, they're going for the creative minds, for the ideas, for the people who look at things in a totally different way to anybody else. Creativity, massive. I know you've got a huge creative industry sector here, um, at the expense of London, actually, with the, with the tax relief on film. But we won't talk about that too much. Anyway, creative business environment. This is where it gets interesting, because this is the third factor that every inward investor wants to know about. And what does business environment include? Tax? Yes, everyone thinks tax is the kind of panacea it's important, but it isn't, is my experience. Now, you know, if somebody says to you, I'm going to Dublin rather than London because of the 12.5% tax rate, that's entirely their business. When I then tell them, well, where are your customers? Oh, they're in London. Okay, so you've got to balance access to customers, access to talent, with a slight saving on your tax. Think about it. And that's the sort of conversation we want to have. The other thing London's got is there's the most international financial centre in the world with the stock market that is the most international. It's not as big as New York, but New York's very domestic US. Most international access to capital and access to lawyers and accountants who are skilled in the business of doing international business is really important. It's a huge selling point for us. And companies that are trading globally need that. So you need to think about how you might pitch that. Convergence. Convergence and proximity. Decision makers like to be next to other decision makers. So London's got more international and European and global headquarters than any other city. A statistic too good to check, as the mayor would say. But the point is, there are so many key decision makers in London that more want to come there to make their decisions for their global business. Convergence, proximity, clusters, very, very important particularly for London. Stock exchange, metals exchange, Lloyds of London for, insur uh, for insurance, regulators. Depends on the sector. If you're in pharmaceuticals, regulation's really, really important. If you're in tech, not so much. But if, if you've got regulators in close proximity or in the city or you can get to them, businesses like that. You've got to have office space. You've got to have property. It's got to be at the right price. 
So, you know, as I said before, London's growing. We need to build houses, lots and lots of houses. 50,000 units a year we need to build. We probably do about 27,000 on average, so we've got an issue there. So if you're building houses or you're building commercial space, you need to think about having the solutions on that. Quality of life, as I said before, soft drivers, really important. This is a beautiful city. I saw that driving in. When I was on the West Coast, I spent a lot of time in Seattle, never crossed the border. I'll come back again, given what I've seen. So we're doing pretty well. Now, I'm not going to say it's all to do with London and partners and to do with me. A lot is to do with what London has to offer as an international trading city. But you've got to keep reminding people about London and every independent or well, even not independent for that matter, but researchers, analysts, consultants try to analyse and compare and differentiate between the cities because it's a big business. Deloitte's research says 40% of the European headquarters of the world's top companies are in London for all the things that I've talked about. Paris way, way behind with, with 8%, Sacre Bleu. Um, New York with 25... But all these... This, this is important to us. And building a reputation that can be underpinned by people other than me as the, as the mayor's salesman, really, really important. Um, what the HQs bring? Yes, they may not bring large, large numbers, but it's the highly skilled jobs that are important and people tend to stay. We did a, a, re, a piece of research around the Olympics where... 70-odd percent of young professionals in Europe said, we want London on our resume at some point during our career because it says a lot about us if we've worked in London. Perfect. This is the Google um, example. So I use this a lot because he's picked out the three key things that we always talk about. Talent, markets, capital, business environment. If Google is saying that, it must be right, right? But the, the point is, that, that I, didn't, I didn't write that. That's what he's thinking about. And uh, kind of to finish, Alibaba. So if you look at the McKinsey report, so North America is our bread and butter, right, as a, as a market for us, as a way we get investment, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, et cetera. On the back of the McKinsey report, what's happening in the East? Things are changing. I was in China two weeks ago, which is why I look so fresh. Um, two weeks ago, and talking to Chinese companies about why London but I'm not saying Europe in front of North America. It's not an either or if you're a Chinese company. It's a matter of which one first or when. So does that open up something for Vancouver? Maybe it, maybe it does for you to answer, I guess. But it isn't either or. Companies don't think that way, particularly the state-owned enterprises of, um, of China, where the Chinese government is actively pushing them out. So I wouldn't... I wouldn't advise them to do both quite at the same time because you, could, that could, you can make a mess of that, but it's not either or. It's a matter of when. So do they come Vancouver first, then come to London? Do they go to London first and then come to Vancouver? Up to them, I guess. Depends on where their customers are, where the talent is, the nature of their business. Alibaba, again, huge talent pool, savvy in international trade, hiring talent, again, talent being the, the driver. So I am going to um, stop there because... I've cantered through a sort of view from London trying to... Well, I was going to cover everything that Colm told me he was going to say, but then he went completely off script as normal. So I hope that somehow there's a join between, between the, the two. But I'll leave it there and then hand back and then if there's anything else you want me to cover during the, uh, during the Q&A. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>